Hi, I'm Daphne Brogdon, and this is 24 Inside. And today, we really are inside 24. As you can see, I'm in President Logan's presidential retreat right over that wall, CTU. We are going to talk to the people who really put 24 on the air. Well, who better to be in the presidential retreat with than the man who designed it, Joseph Hodges, the production designer. Hello. Thank you for joining us, Joseph. Okay, now this is really incredible to me to be here because watching it, I thought this was a real place. I thought, oh, they found a little house in Las Feliz. Uh, no, it, it's all on stage from day one. We didn't shoot any. We shot the exterior just sort of in the, uh, the stables and sort of. But there's no actual sort of establishing shot at the, ex the exterior of this building. So now it's all on stage. Well, one of the things I think is so neat is that it's a presidential retreat, but it doesn't have some big overblown sort of Dallas look. It really seems like a house with kind of yeah, corners. Yeah, we just sort and of wanted to... I mean, originally I designed uh, the old uh, Palmer's retreat. Um, and because I, I, I hate backings. So what the, does that mean, backings? You know, the picture of the skyline with buildings and right. you know, just fields or trees or whatever. I mm -hmm. hate backings. Because when you move slowly, because the backing's so close to you, it moves too quickly. So in the second season, I built uh, this retreat with um, with courtyards, but and and they helped sell the uh, the, the the passing of daytime. Mm. But they were never really big enough to actually shoot any scenes in. So this time, I thought I'll build this huge retreat, and I'll, I'll you know I'll build a big courtyard instead of having a backing out the window. I'll build a big courtyard. The inspiration for this? Did the producers, when they say we're going to need a presidential retreat? Do they say, and here's what the characters are like, or how do you no, decide to I'm make lucky, it look I'm like lucky this? that Joel and, and gang just say we're going to have a presidential retreat and go have at it. I mean, over the five years, uh, they really let me design the show. Uh -huh. I mean, there's occasionally Joel, Joel will tell me that he, he doesn't like something and it should have gone this way, but we don't really usually sit down. They trust me now with the mm -hmm. look of the show. So this, again, it's just, it's stemmed from five seasons of, of 24. 24 was supposed to be just about creating cool spaces, a cool looking yeah. show. And um, personally, I based everything on a, a 60s television show with puppets called Thunderbirds. Oh, yes, so, I remember Thunderbirds. So it was all very Thunderbirds. John and I always joke about it. It was all very Thunderbirds. But and this is sort of Lautner, Frank Lloyd Wright. That wasn't. Uh... Well, no, it's very Thunderbirds, really. Is it's this not really still Frank a Thunderbirds? It's not Fra Frank Lloyd Wright. It's, uh, I d I, again, it's kind of something that I've been developing, uh, you know, like the, the, the detail of the doors. Yeah, that's great. And there's no, I don't know. Again, we, 24, we like to shoot through things. So I'd never mm. seen. I haven't seen a door with, with glass with wood stuck to it, but mm -hmm. I just thought it would, would look good. And it kind of looks like, I can't remember the name of the things. You know the ink splotches? Uh, so uh, when the Rorschach test. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so when Rorschach. you have the two, um, two doors closed, they kind of it tells really you says different else. things. I don't know, it's very difficult for me to explain. I, I just sit, what sit about down the, and... What uh, the horses? What was the... Well, just again, because we're at the ranch and supposedly, you know, um, Mrs. Logan is... Uh, we've seen the stables and mm -hmm. she obviously is into horses. And so we've got the horses dotted around the place. The watercolours you see on the, on the walls of mm -hmm. my father's... Um, oh. He did them uh, in, like, 1955 at his military service in Cyprus. So oh, how it just It just feels right for this space. Like the conference table, again, it sort of developed as a, as a shape because of this room. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when I finished it, I'm sitting at my desk at home looking at a little model of a Spitfire, a World War II sort of fighter yeah. plane, and it's exactly the same layout. It's, a, it's exactly the same shape, so now I call that my Spitfire table. Is it right? Although originally we were going to paint it as if it had been cut out of a big uh, redwood. And then put it in calligraphy. We were going to put all the sort of dates, 1666, this happened and whatever. But we ran out of time, so it just got painted with a, um, a rising star, which was <laughs> a kind of kind Japanese, of a play, right? yeah, kind of a play on the end of last season where uh, Jack sort of was interrogated by the Chinese, and I don't know, there we didn't go. know where, who they were. So, so is know. there anything from this set that you would personally want to keep in the season? Uh, done? Yeah, that light fixture is going to. Me. <laughs> that is I definitely great. want that. I, 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 again, I don't know why. I just sort of want to design, look, every time I design a table, I always design something, a light fixture over the top. And I had an image of, um, I had these when I was a kid, playing with these plastic square yeah. plates that they interlock. Uh -huh. And I just thought it'd be fun to do the same sort of thing in wood and have it hanging over this table. It just feels that sort of era. What's been some other, I remember last season, uh, uh, we talked about how, you know, it, well, on a certain budget, you have to make a lot of locations right. look different, and that's always a challenge. What was one of the more challenging interiors you had? Uh, the gas plant was fun because we had to explode a gas plant without actually exploding a gas plant, and we didn't have much money. So How do you do that? 
Uh, well, we did it really cleverly. We just John and I, we stand there and we go, look, if we have Kiefer running down here, we can just see these explosions. We don't actually have to blow anything up. And then in a big wide, we built two half tanks that were half the size of, in height, of the existing tanks. And I paint big numbers on them so that you can, you know, you recognize them immediately. And, um, and again, it's a 24 thing as well. I paint big numbers on everything. <laughs> the elevator doors, if I can put... Uh, it tells the audience immediately. I mean, people laugh when I put a huge number five on, on the door, but, you know, the president gets into an elevator and it says five. Uh -huh. And then, you know, the doors open and you know he's now on G, the, you know, in, in the basement or something. It just sort of sort of tells the, that you've gone down. I don't know. Yeah. That's what yeah. somebody... You know, well, that's what surprised me in the CTU set. I thought that was all different layers. And no, it's just one big open place, yes, place space. Yes, but very clever the way it seems like it's all different floors on, on the show. Yeah, no, we, uh, it's a constant fight to keep them in, in areas. Yeah. They go to the president's retreat, uh, president's bedroom at lunchtime and they all sleep in there. No kidding. Yeah, it's not really. Well, I, I did take a, a little cat nap <laughs> in Martha's room, actually. <laughs> Joseph, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. All right. And who came up with the idea of 24? Well, we're going to talk to one of them, Bob Cochran, the co-creator and executive producer. Bob, you've been here since the beginning. You were the co-creator of 24. Are you surprised that now season five you can still find ways to mine the, the, the concept of the show? I was surprised in season two, so <laughs> I'm really surprised now. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's, been uh, it's a challenge. But uh, every year we just, you know, take it a little bit at a time and we get through it. But I am surprised, yeah. Well, this season, I have to say, it's, it's really kind of complicated. I mean, I'm finding this season, uh, as opposed to maybe the last couple, having to be like, okay, now wait a minute, we've got two major issues going on here and is it hard for you all to keep track of it? It is kind of hard for us to keep track of it but uh, we get a lot of help from the cast and the crew and people are always popping in saying you can't do this back in episode six that person's dead or that person's whatever it is you know and so we get a lot of help but the continuity is always an issue. Yeah, I, I, would, I, I need a continuity person in my <laughs> living room. Um, I would think that speaking of, of dead you have killed off some beloved characters this season first off i was upset about tony right you know and were you thinking uh, we shouldn't kill him off he's a favorite character well we always have that uh uh dilemma when the chance or the the uh i wouldn't say opportunity but the uh, possibility of killing someone uh comes up because we love uh the characters that we have or they wouldn't be on the show and we love the actors but we found over the years that if you're going to kill somebody uh, it has to be somebody that the audience cares about. Otherwise, it has no impact whatsoever. Uh, it's just a TV show where somebody dies. So the, the only way to make a death mean something uh, is to have it be a, a person that, or a character that, that the audience cares about. And we do agonize over it, and we do uh, think about it a lot and debate it internally, but we're very story-driven. So if we think uh, something works well for the, for the show, for that, for that year's story, then we do it. And Edgar. Poor Edgar. Edgar, I know. People Very took sad. that one hard. I know, they really did. But again, he was, uh, you know, that means something. Do you take the actor in, like, privately and, like, okay, yeah. I want to show you the script? Well, we tell him as soon as we know it's going to happen, we, we call and, in person if possible and say, uh, is there a fruit basket that goes around? <laughs> no, but I do think that people, uh, th nobody's thrilled with it, but uh, so many people on the show over the seasons have, have died that uh, certainly no actor takes it personally. <laughs> you know, they, they know it's, uh, it's part of the show. I want to shoot a couple questions at you that we have from sure. fans. Uh, Begonia in Clinton, Mississippi wants to know that now that Tony's gone, uh, she thinks you ought to make that German operative, Colette's boyfriend, Jack's new partner, they can kick ass internationally, perhaps for season six. I think she thinks he's attractive. I think it's the subtext there. Well, it's certainly not out of the question that we would bring him back. I kind of thought he seemed like he was going to have more legs, especially because yeah. he was uh, felt betrayed by Jack. Yeah, he's got a, he's got a grudge against Jack, and so it's, that's an interesting thing to, to play with. So we, that's something we're keeping in mind. And also, you've had some, besides Sean Astin, some, some big names, uh, C. Thomas Howell and then Joe Beth Williams, which I was loving, and then she was she got shot and she was gone. Yeah. Is she coming back? Um, she may. We don't have any plans right now, but you know we don't plan very far ahead. Oh, is that right? How oh, far absolutely. advanced do you plan? About two episodes. Really? Yeah. So do you ever, by that short amount of planning, then get to that episode and go, oh darn, if only we hadn't done this and this other episode, we could do this now. All the time. Yeah. Really. 
But then we sometimes we go back and uh, make adjustments in previous episodes if we can. We reshoot oh. things. Can uh, you give me an example of something that you reshot? Oh, boy. Um, there's a million <laughs> examples, but uh, off the top of my head, I probably can't. But there's uh, just things where uh, people, a lot of times it's a small thing like... Um, uh, you might not even have to reshoot. You might just re-edit something. Mm -hmm. if, if you need a storyline where a certain character does not know something, but in fact they do know it because of what you, you have to go back to that scene and either remove that character from the scene or edit the scene in such a way that that information doesn't come out or somehow just make sure that character doesn't know whatever it is they're not supposed to know. Then you can go ahead and tell the story you want to tell. So it's not always a big deal, mm -hmm. to, but you do have to keep it straight and, and make those changes. Yeah, and, and do the actors then, uh, do they have a problem with making that adjustment? Or sometimes they're like, yeah, 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 this seems like a better call. Um, honestly, it's going to happen. So yeah. I think they just go along with whatever uh, whatever we say. Whatever you throw that's at That's going to happen. Okay, Mark in Libertyville, Illinois wants to know, oh, did you know from the start that Logan was going to be the villain, or did he did his character evolve from the wimp president? Now, this is, of course, perfect since we are in the presidential Yeah, I think right it's a good question. I, uh, I think it did evolve. Yeah. It did evolve because we played him a certain way uh, for uh, last season too, and then uh, this season, and that's entry is very interesting. And, and uh, Itzen is Greg Itzen is terrific. I think he's an he's amazing terrific. actor. Yeah, because he just when you're thinking this guy is all oh, this worthless piece of whatever, and then he shows this humanity, and you're like, ooh, yeah. there's something more going on there. Yeah, so we decided to open up yet another window into him, and he's not as he's actually not a wimp. Yeah, he's actually pretty tough. Well, of course, now we're finding out he's a really bad guy, but I'm not sure, is he a bad guy with the whole Russian thing or, like, with the Walt, I think I'm being a patriot thing? It's more like the Walt, I think I'm being a patriot thing. This okay. group of people did something which they thought, uh, <clears throat> in the long run, would aid the United States' uh, position in the world, you know, strengthen our uh, economic and, and military and political position in the world. Mm -hmm. It involved a little deception, which backfired. But their motives were patriotic. So, obviously, one thinks of uh, the Iran-Contra scandal or the President-Iraq war. Is there at all a, a critique of the President administration in this? No. We, uh, we our show exists in a parallel universe right. where uh, the, the terrorism is happening and things are happening, but it doesn't refer either uh, uh, explicitly or implicitly to anything that's going on in this world, mm -hmm. specifically. We're not trying to, we don't have any agendas, we don't have any points to make, we're telling stories. Just the good old power corrupts. Tell, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. that kind of point. But we're not commenting on the political situation. Here. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting with the, with the, uh, the actor that plays President Logan because I've, I've tried to discern whether it's his acting or the writing that's so nuanced because he does fluctuate so much. I it's think the writing. The writing is just brilliant. It's really no, I'm good. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Right? No, of it's course it's he's a really good actor, but I mean, it's, it's, you guys have, have given him a, lo a lot of some room to move there, I think. Yeah, well, you'd, a lot of times um, what we do uh, is suggested by what an actor can do. Mm -hmm. Greg, Greg Gitson's a great example. Another example... Uh, from your uh, the first two or three seasons, were, um, was uh, uh, Penny Johnson who played uh, uh, yeah. um, Palmer's, yeah, wife. Palmer's wife. The, f the first episode of the show, uh, the pilot, she just had a few lines. She was kind of a political wife, just talking to her husband and, mm -hmm. and sort of uh, nurturing him, taking care of him. It was very kind of kind of uh, uh, vanilla. It was fine. Mm -hmm. And then as the season went on, we noticed that she really had an ability to, to deliver lines and give you a mm -hmm. sense that there was something going on there. So we began to write to that. And by the end of the season, she was Lady Macbeth. I was just going to say, the Lady Macbeth, And yeah. wonderful. So that was a situation, and, and there have been others, where we write more for a character when we see what they can do with it. And Greg Edson's another example of that. Yeah. Have you ever, and you don't need to name names, been decided to underwrite somebody after you saw what they could do? Sure. <laughs> But we won't say no, who. it happens everywhere. But, of course, that brings out the, the, other, uh, the other death that broke my heart right away was uh, no more President Palmer. I know. Well, that was, uh, we were sad about that, too. But we also we felt a couple things. First, um, uh, we, we, uh, we loved the character. Yeah. He's a noble character. I think most people who watched him <laughs> voted for him for president. Right, right. Uh, so we showed the noble side of him, and then we showed him in a couple of situations where he was uh, tempted mm -hmm. by uh, by uh, terrible pressures mm -hmm. to do things that he wasn't proud of, and he himself 
I think, on occasion, remarked that he'd, he'd gone down roads he never thought he would go down. So we've done all those things with him. Yeah. And then you begin to feel like, uh, what, what can else? you do that's not either repeating yourself or becoming so far out there that it's not believable anymore. Well, and also the difference between Jack having an ally in a presidency and now he doesn't. Yes, exactly. That's another very good point. So by, by killing uh, Palmer in the first episode, um, it's, a, it's a heck of a way to begin the season. It's a shocking beginning. It's really going to get people's attention. And then you get to play a, a whole different color, as you say, for Jack Bauer. He no longer has this strong ally in the White House, and now he almost has to work around or maybe against the president. So it's just a different way to Speaking tell the story. Of, of strong allies, are we going to see William Devane anymore? Um, when's the last time you saw him? Oh, last season? Yeah, you will. <laughs> oh, goody. Because <laughs> I loved him. That was a, yeah, he's that was great. A, a great character. He's great. All right, Chris and Bartow, Pennsylvania. Uh, did you guys plan early on to make Aaron Pierce a pivotal role this season? I have always loved that character. He seems like a Secret Service seems agent. real. Totally real. Totally real. That's another example of an actor who um, we liked him. Mm -hmm. uh, and but we had no particular plans for him. But the more we wrote for him, the, he carried things beautifully. Carried him off beautifully. So the answer to the question is no. We didn't plan at the start of the season to make him a pivotal character. And what's with the little stuff with the, between him and the first mm -hmm. lady? They spend a lot of time together. She's married to Itson, you know. I mean, it, uh, yeah. Not to Itson. She's married to Logan. Right, right, yeah. right. She needs a little loving. Yeah, she needs a little attention. That was like, whoa. Well, Jean Smart is great. That She's was, terrific. Now, did you think of the character and then find her, or think, how can we work Jean Smart into this? We thought of the character. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it was suggested to us by, um, uh, not in any real specific way, but in a general way by Martha Mitchell. So that was the general character. We thought, get somebody in there who who uh, everybody treats as though she's crazy or, or whatever it is, but in fact, she has something to say and she's pretty smart, no pun intended. Does that mean that uh, not only was Walt wanting to kind of seem like she was cuckoo, but are we now we're going to find out that Logan wanted her to seem cuckoo to destabilize her too? I think she probably did have problems mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to work very hard mm -hmm. to make her seem a little unbalanced or unstable. But the thing that one of the things that made her unstable was having to live in a situation which she sensed that things weren't what they seemed to be. Her husband was drifting further away from mm -hmm. her. Um, maybe she sensed that he was doing things that she that he wasn't even that he shouldn't be doing, and that she wouldn't be proud of. She knew about them, and, and the distance right. between them helped make her uh, unstable. Now, here's one thing that's been bugging me. I don't know if you can address this, but the whole thing of that Palmer called her and said. You know, I've got to talk to you. It's a matter of security. I'm thinking, a former president, why would he just call the first lady? Can he go to the Joint Chiefs of Staff or something? He could have, but our, our sense was, or our, our, what we were positing was that they had a relationship. She would be closer to the president than anybody, mm -hmm. closer than the Joint Chiefs, closer than anyone. Mm -hmm. So if anything was going on there, he might be able to get it through her or maybe have her not spy for him exactly, but kind of look around and see if there was something going on that uh, that shouldn't be going on. Because you never know, the Joint Chiefs might be in on it, or they might be just following orders. I mean, they've been told to do something. They may not want to talk about it. But Martha, who's kind of out of the loop officially. Clever name. Yes. <laughs> could be in the loop uh, unofficially and might be a better source. But you have to believe that they had a a very close friendship and that they respected each other and had a great affection, not an affair, but great affection for each other. All right, from James in Fairburn, Georgia. I keep reading on the web that Edward Norton is guest starring in 24 this season. Is that true? No. Where does that come from? I don't know. I love Edward Norton, but he's not, he's not going to be on the show this year. <laughs> yeah, right. Sorry, you're not even going to get shot in one episode, nothing no. or anything like that. So when you said, like, you're surprised that season five is doing so well, or, you know, going along when you thought maybe season two you, you had tapped it. Do you now have the confidence that, oh, this could go on and on, or you, you see it as, a, as finite? No, I mean, I think, honestly, the first year was so difficult that uh, we, when we got renewed, mm -hmm. we thought very seriously about coming back <clears throat> with a different format. Oh. Instead of doing the whole season in one day, which is the, the idea of the show, we thought we'd do every episode in one day. So each mm -hmm. episode would take place in 24 hours. So we could still call it 24, but we wouldn't have to put up with the uh, the storytelling uh, puzzle part of it that's really quite difficult to do. So we actually wrote a script 
that would have been the first episode of year two mm -hmm. that took place in 24 hours, just that one script. And it just, it just wasn't the show. That it's would just, be a lot of action, too, wouldn't it? Well, no, just a TV show. Oh, I mean, you know, okay. it's just because, I mean, most TV shows, you could say, and I, yeah, I mean, CSI or any of these shows, they might take place in 24 hours. It's no big deal. You don't even think about it. But, yeah. But they could, but not ours because of the format we had, you know, we'd come up with at the start. So when we wrote the show, um, it just felt like it was just another TV show. There wasn't anything different about it. There wasn't anything special about it. It was okay. But it wasn't what we had been doing, so we thought, well, let's let's try to do it again the way we did it the first year. And the second year uh, was difficult, but once we got through it, then we began to think, well, I guess if we did it twice, we can probably keep doing it. And I feel that way now. It's still hard to do, mm -hmm. but we've done it enough so that I, I feel like yeah, we'll probably be able to do it as long as uh, as people want to watch. So when you look back at another show you did, like La Femme Nikita, are you like, ugh, oh, that was so easy compared to this? No show's easy, yeah. But relatively speaking, it is because we just don't have the uh, the storytelling freedom that you do on most shows. I mean, shows have arcs. Mm -hmm. Every show, uh, you know, any any uh, hour long show has arcs about the characters. They're going through personal crisis, or their relationship evolves. You can do those things, but we have to do it minute to minute for 24 straight episodes. And a lot of cell phone drama. A lot of cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of the cell phone. Yeah. Well, I mean, how could you? Did you ever think, okay, what if we'd done this? 10, 12 years ago, how could this show be done without cell phones? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it couldn't be. Curtis, go stand by the pay phone. I'll tell I you know, what that's I'm right. It's true. That's how the split screens came about, ah. the cell phones. Because when we wrote the pilot, everybody's on their phone all the time, which is true to life. Mm -hmm. But it's also boring to watch people on the phone, usually. So in order to, uh, to deal with that, the, uh, the director and then the editor eventually, uh, Stephen Hopkins was the director, Dave Thompson, the editor then, of the pilot, um, came up with the idea of, of Hopkins' idea when they shot was to make uh, every phone call, at least one of the people would be moving or doing something, have some you know, dynamic sense to it, yeah. Yeah, driving, walking, shooting somebody, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and then you sp do the split screen thing where you have one, here's a guy talking, and then here's a guy who's moving, talking, and then here's a wide on him moving. So you have some sense of motion, even though it's a phone conversation. And that was why the split screens came about. And then we realized, you know, the split screens were great because we have these multiple storylines. It's a great button it's on just the end a, of the It's segments. a great way to, but yeah. we hadn't thought of any of that until we got into the shooting and the editing, really. Okay, so I was going to say end, but they're actually the beginning of the segments. But then at the, towards the end of the show, you always know when that montage comes up, there's going to be one right. more powerful nugget. Right. And that kind of keeps That evolved as well, yeah. And also, the first season, you have the, I'm Jack Bauer, this is the longest day of my life, or whatever. And by season two, you're like, uh, he can't keep saying that. No, they're all, they're all long. <laughs> they're all yeah. long days. <laughs> yeah, forget about that. Yeah. Um, do you think, uh, are we going to see uh, his daughter come back this season? Maybe. Okay, maybe, but then maybe. the future season. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you're never going to do like a Bobby Ewing Dallas, like somebody who's been killed is going to come back. It was a, it was a shower thing. We can't do that because of the real time thing. We can't have dreams. We can't have flashbacks. We can't do any of that stuff. But somebody you think is dead might turn out to be alive. That could happen. Oh, Jack Bauer. Yeah. Mm. Bob, I want to thank you so much oh, for allowing you. me into the presidential retreat <laughs> and to talk to you. I'm, I'm, on the, I'm on the edge of my seat. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Well, that's it for this episode of 24 Inside. I'm Daphne Brogdon. We'll see you next time.